Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 70. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Naftula Tesler. Now, it's interesting that I am Naftali, and so is he. Our pronunciations are just a little bit different based on where we sit in our own little universe, so to speak. But it's the first time I'm ever inviting someone with the same name as I. I'm super excited. Who is Naftali Tesler? He is Chief of Staff at Amaspic of Kings County in Brooklyn, New York, where he has served for the past 10 years. He started out doing IT and being the handyman and has grown into an important leadership role. Hamaspic provides community health and human services. They have changed the landscape of how special needs are viewed by removing the stigma and are doing the same with mental health. Naftullah has a strong passion for leadership and gets personal satisfaction out of helping people and impacting his community. Naftullah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I've really looked forward to this conversation for some time. Uh, I know how much leadership means to you. We're going to unpack that a little bit. And, um, you know, I was really surprised because when we first got to know one another, I didn't necessarily understand this element. I thought you were involved in your in your work and obviously making an impact. But you take uh, personal leadership very seriously. I would say a deep interest and maybe even a borderline obsession with leadership and how it affects yourself and affects others. Where did that come from? Right. And tell me also, Naftula, how, how has that served you? Um, you know, because we could obsess over things and it doesn't necessarily serve us. But clearly, this is something that you're very focused on and it's making a difference. Good. So I, it started out by just a call after I got married, take a you know, first job. And then uh, after a year, year and a half, come to work as the handyman, you know, literally shoveling snow, plunging, plunging toilets, fixing into shelves, whatnot, at a must with Kings County. And while I did that, um, I had the, whatever I, w- I was raised with the lens of giving. I don't remember a Shabbos, leader, a Shabbos meal at my house, my parents' house without guests. And I'm not talking about guests, family, or friends. We're talking about guests, you know, people who, who are in the street with, with no food. I remember when collectors used to come collect money, it wasn't how much we gave. Um, it was, you know, in the summer with a cold bottle of water to accompany them on the journey collecting money or in the winter a hot bowl of soup so i was raised with giving 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 when i joined the mastic i also had that lens of giving whatever i did i gave i gave to the individuals who served i i remember i I was so excited shoveling snow in front of a group home so i i I went on saturday night sunday to shovel snow because like this they could go to their program tomorrow so anything and everything i did was with the lens of giving giving for my coworkers, giving for the individuals we serve and Beyond Hamas, I also had some other things in the community. I was very involved in helping people get that free personal finance and all that. So I used to sit with couples, hundreds of couples that I sat with and used to coach them through how to get out of debt. And I saw how much I connect with them and I helped them. And I was like, if I could scale this and make it even bigger, if I could learn public speaking and give you know workshops, seminars on a bigger scale, and the more I got into it, I saw how much more I could give to the community by, by elevating in my personal growth. And, and you know, that's where I, I went into leadership. I still remember the first um, personal growth class that I went through, uh, which is La Hasek for Yidl Melber. I remember the first leadership thing that I attended, which is um, the Leaders Forum by Manny Hoffman, the CEO of PTEX, part of his Let's Talk Business Movement. And the more I got involved with the leadership, I saw what an what a impact it's making on me, the people around me, friends and family, and how much more I could give for the community. So I got this. I'm, I'm, anything I could touch with leadership, that's what I'll, I'll you know, consume. You know, what and I it, love about your answer, Naftul, is that you talk about leadership from a very good place. You know, oftentimes leaders, I mean, the very best leaders certainly are thinking similarly, but Leaders come from all different backgrounds. And the question ultimately is what motivates us, right? Why are we 
seeking those positions at the top or at least somewhere towards the top of our organizations, our companies? Is it because we want to just find an opportunity to serve ourselves, let's call it, or are we deeply committed to the service of others? And, and I you're, asking me, you're asking me what it served me. So I have a hassle of need to serve. For me, there's only servant leadership. Um, I remember once my rabbi was appointed to, to be a head of an organization and he gave a speech and he was like, it's not that I got, you know, I got a crown now. It's not like I got the head of an organization. I just got myself more work. I'm rolling up my sleeves to make it happen. So servant leadership is the only leadership out there. It has served me well by being able to serve others. My personal mission why i exist is to connect deeply with hashem god family and community through service and influence and we could maybe later unpack my core values and my vision but ultimately where i'm going is to communicate lead and serve to have inner freedom a healthy family and make an impact in my community so when i serve when i give i receive so it, it helped me tremendously grow as a person and make an influence and an impact in the community and the people around me great yeah, and being able to rattle off your core values like that is fantastic too. Not everybody can do that. So I, I did my nice. core values. My core values, what I stand for is to consistently be connected to Hashem. Charity begins at home. Giving for the sake of giving. Relationships over everything. Never-ending growth. So that is also never-ending growth. It's, it's part of why I'm so obsessed with it. I have a feeling if I woke you up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, you'd be able to tell it to me verbatim. I don't know if in Yiddish or in English, but I'd hear it from you. You know, there's a story I remember reading uh, in the biography of Anatoly Sharansky, who was one of the Refusenik Jews who lived in Russia in the 1970s when the communist regime was just so difficult and overbearing. And many people who had uh, attempted to emigrate to Israel to leave uh, the Soviet Union were isolated socially, financially, and otherwise. They became known as Refusniks because they were refused uh, an exit visa. And so eventually Sharansky, because of his work, was, was taken to the Gulag in Siberia as part of a, as, as a prisoner, um, of being somewhat of a dissident to the state. And he recounted that many people who were in prison were operating with a false identity. And the, the way that they would determine whether or not this guy was who he said he was, was by waking him up in the middle of the night by calling out the name. If the person responded, that person was, in fact, who he claimed to be. But if he didn't respond, they assumed it was a false identity. So that's I'm, like... I, I'm extremely passionate about it. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it to myself like 20 times a day. I have it here in my office. Can I give you with a sham family and community to service and influence? There you go. So you got to wear it on your sleeve, remind yourself all the time, and filter everything really through that process. But I, I do want to come back to one point before we, we go any further, because you did hit on it, Naftuli, and, and I just think that it's really important. You know, we don't recognize the impact of our, of our act. Nobody ever knows the full impact of their actions. Um, sometimes people just observe us from a distance, and because of that, something happens. So we never truly know. But one thing that was very clear is that you told me your parents, your family set a standard for you, set an example through giving, giving to others, members of the community, to those who were most in need, and being selfless about it. And that has clearly impacted your work as well. So I'm just curious whether it's your, obser your observation of other leaders, your sense of your own impact, um, what is it that leaders can be doing besides for running their organizations? Clearly they need to be decision makers, they need to get things done. But what are some of the, let's call it soft skills or almost invisible activities that leaders can and must be doing that helps to set a standard that not only drives engagement or motivation, but also just creates their own legacy as far as who they were and how that could possibly impact people moving forward. So to me, it, it, it's like being, integrity means when you do the right thing when nobody sees it. And to me, when you ask this question, the first thing that comes to mind is Steve Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If, and, and this is a book that changed my life. If you, are leading yourself first. And, and I think this is by leading by example, I would say. If you could lead yourself, be really, know who you are, what you stand for, where you're going, um, that's automatically the people around you um, will come along with the train, not, not like old fashioned bosses that are pushing and all that. So being a servant leader, um, first be yourself and then bring the people around you. 
uh, with you on the, on the journey. Nice. Okay, so let's stay within the concept of leadership and let's focus on nonprofit leaders. I don't have that many on the podcast, at least I haven't thus far. Yours is clearly a large nonprofit. You serve as your community in Brooklyn and there are many things that Hamas Bik provides. Um, what lessons would you think, Naftali, the nonprofit leaders can teach to their corporate counterparts and what can nonprofit leaders learn from for-profit leaders? Sort of like if we were to cross-pollinate here what are some of the best things you see in both fields? So let me see if I can answer it with, with one answer, answer both, because I think it's, it's very similar and, and people have a misconception with not-for-profits. Not-for-profits have a misconception as well. So we look at the not-for-profit and we run it as a business because you can have many good organizations. We, there's hundreds of hundreds of organizations in our community. A lot of them are, are run very... Um, I don't want to use the word sloppy, but not as organized as you would think a typical business is run. Um, I don't want to name, I'm sure some come to mind because it's only volunteers and it's only, um, you know, you can't expect so much and, and it's, it's, you know, you're doing a nice thing, act of kindness. It's not run as a business. The way our MASPIC operates is we run it as a business because we have to be sustainable. We have to be able to scale. We have to be able to bring our best forward to the individuals and clients we serve. So number one is run it as a business and not because you want to make money, because you want to be able to bring even more to the community. And to me, that's the definition of a non-for-profit. You make profit in one line, what you do, and you invest it. Like, let's say, for, for instance, we change the landscape, especially with children. They used to be hidden in the closets, in the basements, the stigma that was around special needs. It's long gone in our community, thank God. And it's clearly that Amaspik made it happen. Now, we ran it as a business, make sure it makes you know profit and scaling and all that. Now we jumped in a couple of years ago to do the same thing in the mental health community. Now to me, this is something all non-for-profits should learn from the business side of things and run it as a business so you could scale and grow. Now, what the business um, leaders could look at the non-for-profits I think not-for-profits um, typically have a, a higher calling, uh, um, you know, the leaders, the founders for sure, but even everybody involved have, you know, a sense of we are making a difference. Um, they're mission-driven. You know, you could, you could use so many terms for this. I think every single business could become more mission-driven and, and find a higher calling and not just um, come in and have a job, have a job. Because yes, the founder, the, maybe the top people in, in the business have an inner drive, a reason why they went into the business, like a typical entrepreneur found a problem, bringing a solution and all that. But ultimately, when you scale and you have so many employees under you, you've got to make sure to be mission driven, making a difference. So they are excited to jump out of bed, come into work every single day. I love it. I love it. Okay, so so let's talk. Let's talk. I'll use the Yiddish first. Let's talk Tachlis. Let's talk practically about what this means because um, we're using some platitudes here. They're great, you know, 30,000 view, so to speak. Let's have a mission, mission let's have purpose. Um, practically speaking, I have my own ideas on this, but I'd love to hear yours. How does somebody who is running, whether it's a small business, um, an entrepreneur creating a new technology widget of some variation, uh, a larger corporation providing some kind of service or product, how do they start to think about themselves, not just about making a buck, but also about mission and purpose that's, that goes beyond, that provides drive when days are difficult? And frankly, they just want to feel like they've lived their life, not just to build themselves a nice home and to have a nice car, but to have a scaled impact. Great. So I'll, I'll try to be very brief. I don't want to get very technical about it because it's not a platform for that. And we could talk hours just on this one question. So I'll, so I'll try to keep it brief. So number one, if you want to create a purpose, a mission, why the business exists, and what the business stands for, where the business is going, you've got to find with the leader or the leadership team first. So I have, I'm very passionate. I'm very into connect deeply. Uh, my hashtag is connect deeply. You know, it's in my mission statement to connect deeply to our family and community to serve and influence. Now, Leaders want to connect deeper to the people around them. You know, they want to be a better spouse. They want to be a better leader. 
it all starts with connecting people with yourself. So if somebody wants to create uh, a mission, values, vision for their company, I would argue first, look at yourself, look at the guy in the mirror. What do you, why do you exist as a leader, as a person, as a human being? Why do you, why, why, why do you exist? What do you stand for? And start digging in a little bit deeper in yourself, um, who you are, and then bring that personality or typically a few leaders together, the ones who are making the decisions, um, bring that personality of the leadership team into the business. Um, that's in a nutshell, and we could unpack that. I would add to it, one of the things that I heard that I think really makes an impact is to see or imagine the end user of your product or your service, right? How are you changing their life? So whether it's a, whether it's a, um, a cell phone, or a farming tool or product or whatever, right? Some kind of IT service, right? If I'm every day making a difference because the end user's life is enhanced, right? I'm improving the quality of people's existence. So that's another way kind of like to go deeper here. That was great. Sure, absolutely. And I just yeah. the Amazon seller very recently. Um, and this is for me why you exist. Like what difference are you as a person making life? So Amazon seller, of course, he wants to make money and all that. Uh, but what are you selling? It was educational toys for kids. So how do you feel when somebody, you know, he lives in, in, in Muncie. How do you feel when somebody in Washington, when somebody in LA received that Amazon package? Um, what do you think that little kid looks like? And, and have that in mind when, when you talk to your employees, when you motivate them and all that. So that's Yeah, great. good stuff. So I want to get back to one of the things you talked about earlier about making decisions at Hamas Big in terms of, you know, how you service people, trying to scale, trying to really run your nonprofit as a business so that you could have a greater impact. So let's talk about those metrics for a moment. Like, how do you determine, I know you're not making these decisions by yourself, but how do you determine which area, for example, you talked about mental health, you also talked about special needs. So these are different buckets, right? They overlap to a degree, but these are different areas of focus. How do you determine, let's call it institutionally, where your focus is going to be, who you're going to serve, and then take us through, sort of lift the curtain a little bit without getting necessarily overly specific about what kind of metrics you start to identify as, okay, we want to make a difference in mental health. What does that look like, right? Are we talking about numbers of, of patients served? Are we talking about quality of care? Are we talking about something else? How do you go through the process of determining what those metrics are? And if we still have time, you can tell us how you actually measure your success. Okay, so when we decide what to go next and all that, it's all based on what the community needs. So if we have an intake department taking calls, and typically it used to be special needs children, but you know, time over time, again and again, we get calls about mental health and we see an uh, outcry in the community. Uh, outcry is an understatement of what was going on in the mental health community. Uh, we start following it and, and see trends. Is it only one intake person that claims that? Um, start making, you know, a little bit digging deeper in the community, talk to other community activists and, and people in the field of mental health in the community. And if we see there's another great organization involved in something and, and is dealing with this issue, then there's no reason for us to step in. But if we see a void um, in the community on something we feel and we hear back from um, people in the community, leaders in the community, community activists and all that, um, we're going to then sit down and, you know, have conversations about going in to that direction. Um, and yeah, this is very high level special needs versus mental health, but even within the special needs, even within the mental health, there's so like examples that I could give you. Now, how we go about it in, in practical terms, uh, what is needed. So I remember very clearly a couple of years ago when we, you know, made that um we have to be we're very lucky because when we, I'm sorry for get going off track, I'll come back to your question. When we started to see the outcry in the community and all that about, you know, five years ago, very right after that, when we start sensing it and it, and it was on our radar, we got a new executive director at Amas with Kings County, Herschel Wertheimer, and he came all excited to continue with the Hamas big mission to provide people with limitations the opportunity to reach their utmost potential. In, in the special needs field. And over the past couple of years, we've become bigger, bolder, better. Um, there's nothing in the special needs you know, community that we don't cater to our individuals and clients. 
he also came with the background of mental health. He had, he was wired to help people in, in the mental health community. He had helped many of his friends and family. And for some reason, he got involved. He understands the mental health. So when we, we had a, a, a benefit there, we had an opportunity where we could take the outcry of the community. And, and just very recently, a new executive came with a mental health lens together um, is where we got. So I remember very clearly back to the conversation on the question where we were like, okay, mental health, what does that mean? Um, and we were like, and I remember it, and I remember where my executive was sitting. And exactly, I, I, it's so funny. I remember that moment in the meeting. We were like, okay, so we need to have care management for children. We need to have services for children. We need to have care management for adults. We need to have services for adults, and we need to have a clinic servicing children and adults. Now, I go like this, and it takes a second, right? Each of those hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars weeks, nights, hours, and I can't even, even tell you how much it goes into each of those, but I could proudly say that we have it all. Um, very recently, we launched our um, Alcott 81 mental health clinic called Civic Clinic. Wow. And um, so we, we sit and we go in, bring in um, advisors, consultants. Uh, what, what does it take to go into the mental health community? What does the community need? Sure. Uh, working a lot with the leadership and, and community activists, people that are doing the ready to a degree. Um, if that answers the question. I kind of want to jump back in, if I may, for a second, because what you said before with your new CEO, at least new at the time, really resonated a lot with me. And I'll tell you specifically what I'm thinking about. So I'm a former head of school, and, and we, we had a number of things that we were trying to accomplish. And simultaneously, I was doing a lot of learning on my own participating in leadership training, specifically geared towards academic leaders. And one of the training elements, which was a nice thing, but not necessarily on my radar, was a values-based positive behavior program that could be implemented in a school. It creates an identity, who the students, who the teachers, who the entire institution are, where people of, let's say, respect and responsibility, whatever those values are. And then you, you implement it as, as a, a behavioral expectation. What does respect look like? What does it mean to be responsible in the classroom, on the school bus, in the shared areas, whatever it might be? And then kind of simultaneously, there was this growing agitation, if you will, among some members of our faculty about how certain students were just not behaving in a, the, up to standard. And they were really bothered by it. And as I started to peel back the layers of the onion, if you will, I got more and more feedback. This is a problem we need to address. And so it was a perfect kind of like confluence between the learning that I was doing and the need that was emerging. And it was, you know, sort of like a feather on my cap because we're able to put two and two together and create a program that not only satisfied teachers' needs or desires for improved student behavior, but kind of like implement something that would be exciting and positive and values oriented and all of that. So here, sometimes the leader or somebody on the leadership team has a skill has a passion, has a background. And I'm not saying you necessarily want to force a, a square peg into a round hole, but where there's an opportunity to utilize and leverage that experience with a need in a community, in a school, in a business, whatever that might be, that could be really, really special. So let me ask you one last question before we transition. And that is as follows. So, you know, you've seen a lot of people, you've mentored a lot of people. Leadership is not a, um, a linear progression upward, right? There are ups and downs, personal as well as institutional. Leaders who have failed, and some of the very best leaders, myself included, I'm not saying I'm of the very best, but certainly the very best, whatever, whatever industry, et cetera, have failed. Those failures could be like a, just a product that never effectively launched. It could be something much deeper. It could be relationships. How does a leader who has failed in the past turn things around to become a better leader moving forward? Wow. So I have failed too many times and I will, and it's okay. I just have to get up quickly. Um, but to answer your question, I think you have to have, um, I don't want to say system or mechanism in place, but you have to have people around you and not only people around you, places where you take your um where you take your stuff from, uh, for the lack of a better word, where I'll, I'll give you examples. Like 
I know I have to listen to two new podcasts, two episodes a week minimum. I know that I always have to have a book that I read. I know it was that my I honor to-, to have my podcast be one of them recently. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not even a question. I've subscribed to it and I enjoy it. Um, it, it, I have, I'm involved a couple of years already with the Enter the Leadership Program, um, and I have my mastermind course there. I have my coach there. I, you know, it's, it's having the, the people around you, it could be friends, family, coaches, programs, where you consume your advice and, and your stuff. And constantly when you fail, you have where to go. And also you're not just, um, you know, straight level like i grew and this is where i am we constantly have to have new stuff coming in i i i, I told this to somebody a couple of weeks or months ago and, and you know yesterday he, he left me a message and you told it me i'm just changed one thing in my life I, I started listening to two episodes a week uh, of course that led to signing up to some sort of a program and to and to enter so you have to have a good um system of support i don't have the right word for it but if you have that and it's it, it, the reason i'm saying that is because it's not like okay when i will fail i'll run and see which coach could i hire oh it's probably have i have recently saw a post on linkedin i've heard from a friend about it no you constantly have to be plugged into stuff for the lack of a better word again and when that issue or that challenge or whatever it is arises you have your go-to people and you know and, and it's typically i have a whole array of people it's not one um wow this is what's happening and i don't know how to get out of it I, I i i need somebody to listen to me i need somebody to coach me i need who who could i ask so for every type of question for every type of situation i'll have my go-to people and it's very important and i think it's it's you know um at least in our community where i i, I don't see that much and, and back to the first or one of the first questions you asked me where's the leadership you know drive obsession comes from i think uh, i have seen the the difference it made in my life and in a result i made the difference in hundreds of of you know people in the community just this element to always be open um for new information constantly because i could listen to a podcast or read a book that not necessarily it's interesting for me right now but a couple of weeks later i i had it recently with um we had to implement a a system it's very technical a system how to train and onboard new people and you know a couple of people in my mastermind group mentioned a couple of times that they use train you like training manual train you um to have the system standard operating procedures and this is how they train and all that and i didn't need it at the time but I, you know even a half a year later when there was an issue in the in, in one department and i was like boom do you remember what, what that told so you constantly have ideas and leadership stuff come to your mind you always will know when you know when what book to take off this hill what what to yeah. go back to and so on and what's great is that not only are you talking about you know building resources in advance and uh, under you know sort of adding to your toolkit all the time what you didn't say but i think you implied is humility because every leader needs to be able to say i don't know everything Every leaner needs to be say failure is part of the process and that if I do in fact mess up, I need to be able to turn to others who maybe have different experiences or just a different perspective and learn from them and not just say, now I'm broken, right? Because oftentimes we think I failed, I'm ruined, it's over, I can't do anything about it. But if you have enough humility to bring a lot of people into your network, to learn from them continually, then you could tap into it as you need it. And you could really grow and leverage that. It's interesting that you mentioned that because for the past couple of weeks, I'm very into, yes, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's going to help me. A leadership start with being, being okay to be vulnerable. Let's say in public speaking, the reason why, at least for me, people have fear to go on and, and speak in public is because you're not okay to fail. So be vulnerable. It's okay to fail. And automatically, you don't, you're not afraid anymore and you could go do it. But this is one example. So being vulnerable, humility and all that, is, is definitely on something there. I agree. And I think oftentimes, and with this, I think we'll end the segment, that people have a tendency to think that others around them are looking for the worst to happen. They're looking for failure of some variation. But the reality is most people want us to be successful. Most people want us to achieve. And if you're a public speaker, people who are sitting in the audience, they don't want a failure. 
They want a great speech. They want something that's going to motivate them. They're not rooting for you to fail. They're not piling up tomato cans ready to throw them your way. They are simply there to help, help you know, help you uh, achieve your success. And so that's got to be something that all of us uh, are mindful of as we as we try to do our very best work every day. So Naftula, it's one of my favorite times. I will tell you before I start this segment that you know if you would have asked me ten years ago uh, when I was living in Atlanta, which has a very small, if really any, uh, members of the Hasidic community within it. Uh, that I would be doing a tremendous amount of work within the Hasidic community only 10 years later, actually most of those years through coaching, whether in educational environments or businesses or whatnot, I would have told you there's no way. Um, And so I've learned a lot about the community in particular. And I'm curious to know, this is my first one. All these answers have to be short. I'm sorry. I really wish you could unpack these more. What's a common mistaken stereotype about your community that people should know is just not true? So I think people look at the Hasidic Orthodox community that, yeah, they're, they're business people, either they're on real estate or on Amazon. That's about it. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of solid leaders, see executive leaders within our community coming out of the yeshiva system. And any, any business, any organization you're going to look at, whatever it is, it's fascinating how many people I engage with, uh, you know, on these subjects of leadership and they're in C-spots um, coming out of our yeshiva system. So it's not only the real estate and Amazon and those whatever few um, big ticket items. Yeah, and the fact that you just have all that leadership in general, it's, it's, it's tremendous. The worst advice, Naftula, you were ever given? So I think I'll tie it up to the first one because at one point I was thinking about it. Um, luckily, I didn't do it. Um, that I think that you have to go to college in order to be successful. Um, I'm proudly standing here, a product of the yeshiva system, and I'm very successful, um, making a difference in the community. And it's I, I haven't gone to college, and I'm, I'm I'm pretty okay this way. And I'll keep it short as yes. I happen to have three advanced degrees, but I hear you loud and clear. And I know Gary V and Elon Musk and many others. Uh, have uh, shared a different perspective on, on college than has been traditionally shared out there. And then the final one, a tip to help make the world a better place, because I know that's what you do every day. Connect deeply to everybody around you, but start with yourself. Nice, succinct, but connect. That's really the bottom line. Okay, so enough to let, tell everyone who is listening uh, we've gained so much from your inspiration. I'm sure folks want to be able to learn more about you and uh, and to connect with you. Where should they go to find you and to learn more about what you do? So um, number one on LinkedIn, um, I just have to give the spelling because it's slightly different than, than your name. It's N-A-F-T-A-L-I. Tesla is T-E-S-S-L-E-R. Or they could send me an email to ntesla at hamastickings.org. We're going to put that in the show notes. Everybody can get it. It will be no issue at all. Okay, Naftula, this is, this is the, the last. I hate when these conversations have to end, but they do. Um, with this one, though, as, as I try to do with all of my conversations, I ask my guests to please leave us with one final leadership lesson to engage us, to inspire us, and to really end this conversation on a high. One leadership lesson. Um, so I have to take everything into one lesson. I think the one lesson would be, and I mentioned it before, start engaging into leadership stuff. Find whoever um, I would recommend Naftali Haft and start listening to the Lead to Succeed um, podcast and engage to his, um, he has so many content on his website, um, e-books, e-guides and whatnot. But whatever works for you, um, I'm not going to start name, you know, ideas out there. There's, there, there's so much information. Find a few um, coaches, um, leaders, leaders out there. They, there's so much information out there. Just start plugging in to any leadership program, whatever shape or form it is. Um, and I think the best ROI, ROT, return on time, and the best lesson I could leave off your listeners because you're only giving me one minute is, Go listen to all the advice or, or find whatever works for you. And like this, it's like if you're going to pick up one book um, and you're going to learn a lot there, it's because I want my one minute right here. So 
I want to kind of have more time with, with your audience. So plug into whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever you connect with. Um, and, and that somebody like Naftali Haf or whoever it is will take you to the next level. Okay, well, Naftali, that has been a tremendous uh, end. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. There's so much and it can, you, it's almost like a dizzying thing. We could spend our entire time, our entire life, just reading self-help and leadership and this and that. We have to be able to take what we learn and actualize it. And the only way to do that is to become um, just informed consumers and find the, the, the message, find the process that works for us and kind of run from it, run from there uh, to take things to that next level. And thank you for the plug. I do appreciate it. Anyway, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time for Lead to Succeed. Um, I'm very excited about uh, continuing to develop our relationship. And I'm sure that our listeners will be reaching out to you to find new ways that they can engage in all that you have to offer as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 